This conference will now be recorded. Yeah. All right, everyone can hear us. Thanks, great. I would like to call to order this Tuesday, August 3rd meeting of the Monmouth City Council and uh, ask our city recorder, Phyllis Bullman, for the roll call, please. Roxanne Belts is excused. John Carey? Here. Chris Lopez? Here. Councillor McKeel? Here. Councillor Oberst? Yes. Councillor Salinas Oliveros? Here. Mayor Kuntz? I am here, and I will lead us in the flag salute. Rise, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, tonight on our consent calendar, uh, the minutes of our previous meeting, that of July 20th, and I would entertain any corrections or additions, or at this time, um, a, move, a motion to approve. As usual, move approval. Uh, I, I would um, beg indulgence on one right. item. Um, okay. In um, where is it? In my comment, I I identified that that I would like to. Um, gosh, I'm not following. Maybe I'm in the wrong one. I would like to have discussion about uh, boards and commissions, specifically selection of board of uh, members of the planning commission and to the um, uh, budget, budget committee and it was kind of just a generic deal um, so it's small deal but just so it's on the record <clears throat> on substantive i suppose yeah i don't know that you need to change that phyllis because that has been the comment prior to that and i think that's the only one we had really talked about yeah, and so. i actually was able just before the meeting tonight to send you all uh that a draft of that process oh, to look right. over so councillor McKeel, did you have another correction or addition yeah, yeah actually i actually have a question i am um, uh this was brought up by councillor lopez uh, at after the in our first meeting for july about a statement on native lands and we've made that statement um, that that meeting and then the second meeting in July, and I think it should be recorded as such in the in the minutes. All right, Phyllis, if you could add um, that the uh, lands acknowledgement was indeed read also at the meeting of July 20th. And thank you for that, Councillor McKeel. Um, you will note that we have added that to our agenda. And um, I'm not certain we will read it aloud each night, but it will be a permanent part of our agenda, a recognition to anyone who does look at our public meeting um, that, that we are acknowledging that uh, permanently at this point. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kuntz. And thank you, Ms. Bowman. Madam Mayor, if I could amend my motion to say approve the minutes as amended. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Kerry, <clears throat> for the second. All in favor, um, please signify by saying aye. 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 Great. And any opposed? 
Thank you very much for that. Um, as you can notice tonight, uh, we are, those of us in the room are wearing our masks, again, um, in accordance with the Centers for Disease Control guidance, even though we are vaccinated, we are wearing masks this evening as a courtesy to others and of consideration of the very um, difficult um, health concerns that are being faced right now because of the Delta variant of COVID-19. So we will continue to do that here in Chambers. Um, uh, Madam until... Mayor, if I could just add a quick comment to that. Um, I, uh, through my sister, get a, a missive from a guy who works in virology and infectious disease. And he added a comment to his circular this week that is, don't stress test your vaccination. And he went on to explain that by saying, you know, going to bars right now might not be the very best thing because that's one of the worst places for transmission. When he goes to stores, he's wearing his mask again. And just the general idea is be smart and don't, you know, do your best to avoid situations where uh, you might find yourself exposed to the Delta because we're finding out very clearly that even the vaccinated can catch it, can transmit it even without showing any symptoms of it. So uh, don't stress test your vaccinations. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, we do have time reserved for public comments. Um, Phyllis, have we received any comments prior to the meeting or has anyone online indicated they are interested in making public comment? I have received none and nobody online has indicated that they were making public comment. <clears throat> we have uh, staff in the room with us along with our reporter from the Itemizer Observer. So I see no public comment in the room tonight. Uh, we will continue on to our business agenda. Our first item is a presentation from Jamie Gatewood and uh, this is regarding the Fair Housing Council. Jamie looks like she is, uh, or he is with us online. And um, I will uh, invite um, a Stephanie introduction. Actually, Madam Mayor, you've just done a great job of introducing Jamie Ga Gatewood, who works for the Fair Housing Council. And she wanted to be able to share some of the most recent efforts tonight with the council of of what's going on with, with the council. So I don't have much of a staff report except to introduce Jamie and ask her to say hello. So it says she's offline. Hmm. Huh? So I was trying to make her presenter. Now she's left. <clears throat> trying trying to log back in. Give her one moment before we call up our, yep, waiting for name. She's back. I am so sorry. I don't know if you can all hear me, but I am having some, oh, okay. I'm having some technical difficulties and for some reason I can't hear you. So I'm just gonna mess with the settings one more time. Um, I was having a hard time getting in and out. So I apologize for that. Hey, technology. That's okay. Jamie, we can hear you now, but we can't see you. I don't know if you can hear us. No, okay. Okay, I couldn't hear what you said, but I think I might have it now. Can somebody talk now? Hey, can you hear us now? <laughs> yes, I can. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I have this <laughs> set up. I've used this app before. So, and I so to, in order to use this headset because my other one is not working, I had to turn off my camera. So, unfortunately, <laughs> I hope you won't be able to see my face this evening, uh, but I will have a presentation to share with you. Okay. Um, and if you're ready, let me know. I'll go ahead and get started. Yes, please go ahead, Jamie. Great. Thank you all so much for having me. Let's see here. I'm going to share this and let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay. 
Great. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started then. Um, so yeah, my name is Jamie Gatewood. Hi, sorry about the delay. I'm from the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. And um, the Fair Housing Council of Oregon has been around for, um, well, let's see, I think it's over 30 years, which sounds like a long time. Um, and you know what we do is we uh, promote equal access to housing. And um, we do that through education and enforcement. Um, and we get to educate folks uh, all over the state of Oregon, and that means uh, housing providers and um, folks who are uh, consumers of housing. So, you know, first-time home buyers and uh, rental, uh, you know, people who are renting, and and then we also get to uh, train, you know, pretty much anyone who touches fair housing or any housing. So, realtors and and jurisdictions just like you and counties and um, anyone who makes important decisions around fair housing. And um, we also have advocacy services, just so you all know if anybody you know, or if you hear, oh gosh, you know, this person might be experiencing some discrimination in housing, uh, people can call us. We have a hotline and we can help them to figure out uh, if they are or if they aren't, and then how to take steps um, and action uh, and know what to do in those situations. Uh, we also get to uh, support landlords. So we have a hotline for landlords as well because they have a lot of fair housing questions. It's very nuanced. Um, and so we can, uh, you know, provide information and then also um, send them off to other resources that might be helpful to them. So that's some of what we do. And then of course we provide, like I said, education all over the place. So um, we are a statewide civil rights organization and um, we pro proactively promote housing justice, equity and inclusion. And again, we do that through education uh, enforcement, uh, uh, talking about fair housing laws and enforcing fair housing laws or providing pathways to them really. Um, a lot of our, our advocacy work is done um, like in-house, which is really nice. So 70% of the fair housing cases that come across our table, we get to advocate locally and resolve them at a local level. Often that just looks like a letter explaining like, hey, um, you know, this is what the law is. And a lot of people just didn't know. So it's really nice that we can do that and, and just kind of support everyone and work both sides of the street. But then again, if necessary, and if the advocacy doesn't work, then we can help to go ahead and, and file claims with those other enforcers of fair housing laws. So um, I'm going to try to be really fast. I know we only have 25 minutes, so I'm going to talk quick and hopefully give you a few uh, minutes to answer questions. But this uh, session is going to address fair housing basics. We're going to talk about fair housing needs in our region, common myths about needed housing development, right? Because we hear a lot of pushback and community concern, like saying, we don't know if we want this new housing in our community. So we can talk about that a little bit. And then um, jurisdictions and affirmatively furthering fair housing. We're just going to touch the tip of the iceberg that's a really big topic there's so many great uh you know new like fair housing laws and house bills uh like uh you know with goal 10 house bill 2001 2003 and all of the things that go with that and we'd love to come back and uh, talk to you about those things when we have more time too um, so right now we'll go over the basics really fast. Um, what are fair housing laws? They're civil rights laws that promote equal access to housing. And um, we often think about civil rights laws as those laws that say, you know, we shouldn't be treated differently in our jobs or in school or when we're riding the bus or in other public places. Well, think about fair housing law as those same sets of laws that are applied just specifically to housing. And they make it illegal for housing providers to discriminate against certain groups. Um, and it's different than landlord tenant law. A lot of people get them mixed up. So landlord tenant law is talking about, you know, like what can be part of a lease agreement and how evictions can be handled. But uh, fair housing comes into play when somebody's being treated differently in any of those kinds of housing transactions. It has to do with people's protected identities. So what is fair housing? It's the right of all people to be free from illegal discrimination in the rental, sale, or financing of housing. And in rental housing, that covers, you know, when somebody's applying um, during tenancy and when they're moving out. So the whole process. And fair housing discrimination is treating a person differently in any housing transaction because that person is a member of a protected class. And in just a, like a slide or two, we'll go over who those protected classes are. So important for this presentation, where do fair housing um, and jurisdictions overlap? Where's the nexus there? Um, and it is that um, uh, it has to do uh, with 
where people live. So there's a lot of folks uh, who are members of protected classes living in affordable housing. Um, there are some people who are members of protected classes that might need special consideration um, from the local government, like requesting a reasonable accommodation for um, like the city to make a change. Like for example, if somebody needs a wheelchair ramp to put in, maybe saying, okay, yeah, we understand why you can't meet that setback requirement, right? So, so uh, those kinds of decisions really affect folks who are members of protected classes, for example, um, of disability. Um, and then it has to do with the types of housing, right? So it might be um, uh, like there's proposed housing for people uh, who are members of protected classes, like people who are living in adult foster homes oftentimes um, also are folks who live with disabilities or maybe, um, you know, another protected class that fits in there somewhere. And I'll go over those again in just a moment. Um, and then location and opportunity is a really important one because um, you all make really important decisions about like what kinds of buildings are allowed to exist in what areas of town. For example, um, uh, are you building affordable housing in neighborhoods with like great schools and transportation and job opportunities? Um, is affordable housing spread out, right? Is it in you know different parts of town or is it all located in the same area? Is it segregated? Um, and cities should have clear and objective standards for codes, design, concepts, and ordinances, right? So um, it's easy for everyone to understand and there's no like kind of guessing and nuance there. They're just, you know, you could say, oh yes, yes or no, very clear. Um, for objectives and standards. So who are these uh, protected class uh, individuals I've been talking about? There's a couple of different levels of protected classes. We have federally protected classes, um, state protected classes, and locally protected classes. So federally protected classes are race, color, national origin, religion, sex, and that includes uh, survivors of domestic violence, families with children, so that's familial status, and disability. Um, and a quick example about why these uh, protected classes exist, um, and there are statistics and stories like this for every one of these protected classes, but for example, familial status was not added as a protected class um, until uh, 1987. So before that, um, uh, landlords could say in their advertising, no pets, no kids. Um, which really blocked a lot of housing for families with children. And in Oregon at the time, it meant that almost 70% of the housing market was blocked to families with children. Um, and my mom remembers looking for housing uh, and that was the case, like a lot of the advertising said no children, so it was really hard for her to find find housing as a single mom with four kids. So, and again, there are stories like this for all the protected classes. Um, and so the state of Oregon goes on to add additional protected classes, so marital status, it doesn't matter if you're single, married or divorced, none of those things should come into, into play when you're um, going into a housing situation. Um, source of income, so this one's really important for uh, a lot of Oregon. It's great that it was added as a protected class because a lot of discrimination exists around it. And these are folks who are using um, Section 8 vouchers, agency rental payments, um, TANF, SSI, and SSDI are uh, listed here. They have a little asterisk because they weren't included initially, but um, now we know uh, case law has gone through and um, the cases have been favor, uh, settled in favor of the folks who are being discriminated against because of uh, uh, they used those sources of income. And then sexual orientation and gender identity are also protected in Oregon. And then um, different local um, like cities and counties add their own protected classes as well. So for example, um, Multnomah County, I think they said age over 18, right? They decided that was a protected class because uh, college kids were getting blocked to housing. A lot of uh, housing or landlords were saying you had to be 22 and up, but then the college kids, they couldn't find housing off campus. So they're like, this is kind of disparately impacting them and we're gonna uh, make a choice to add that as a protected class um, at a city level or a local level. Um, and so uh, who must comply with fair housing laws? And the short answer is anyone who touches the housing market. So it could be owners and landlords, housing authorities, property managers, maintenance staff, homeowners associations, real estate agents, uh, mortgage lenders and financial institutions, insurers, neighbors, jurisdictions, and advertising media. Um, and we train all of these different kinds of folks. So um, if you know of a group who's like, oh, like they could use fair housing training, they might be interested, please send them our way. Or if you know of another council, um, we, uh, especially in the Polk, Marin and Yamhill counties, we have grant funding, we'll be so happy to provide uh, training for, for anybody. And um, 
uh, advertising media is included here because it can be discriminatory. Like I mentioned, um, uh, even, well, I guess like Section 8 would be a good example. Sometimes we see advertising that says no Section 8, which is very blatant. But another example would be a maybe a senior community that says, um, you know, folks who are 65 and up can live here. Maybe their advertising was saying healthy and active seniors welcome. Well, if someone was living with a disability that affected their mobility, that might make them feel like a really uncomfortable or like they're not welcome there. And so that's why advertising media is listed here because um, it can be discriminatory. So um, the next part I would like to uh, chat with you about is uh, what's going on in our region. Um, I am the um, education and outreach coordinator for the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, but most of my work has been focused um, in the mid Willamette Valley, particularly Polk, Marion and Yamhill counties. Um, and so during that time and along also, you know, we have a lot of data that comes in through our hotline and um, our website context. We've gathered some information about the area and then also some other organizations have some important data and information. So I'd like to just share some of that with you quickly. Um, so uh, at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, we, like I said, we get about 2,000 uh, contacts a year. And um, for this area, uh, we've discovered some uh, overarching themes. Um, and so the most prevalent kind of discrimination that we hear about in the Mid-Willamette Valley is usually against folks who are living with a disability. Um, and this often looks like um, maybe folks who are uh, supported by different agencies or organizations that uh, support folks um, with a disability that affects like maybe mental wellness, uh, then they'll say, oh no, I I'm not going to rent to this person because you're working with this organization that provides this housing voucher or whatever it is. Um, we also hear about discrimination um, when housing providers or landlords don't want to meet uh, reasonable accommodation requests, which are um, if somebody's living with a disability, they can say, hey, I need this change. It might be a change to a policy or a procedure, or it might be a physical change um, to restore equal access or enjoyment of my unit. And um, what we know is that even though it's the law that that, that should be happening, is the, they have to provide um, documentation from a qualified individual and everything checks out. Um, sometimes they're just not being met, especially for assistance animals is one that we uh, hear a lot of resistance um, on. And uh, it could also be giving out false or inconsistent information, like folks call, they disclose that they have a disability and all of a sudden the unit's no longer available, or maybe it is available, but then when they come to see it physically and maybe they have a disability, like they're using a wheelchair, um, it's no longer available. So those are some of the things that we're hearing about um, um, around that. And then uh, another one is harassment around national origin. Um, uh, this can look like maybe uh, folks picking through applications and, and skipping folks uh, who are of a different national origin, or it could like look like harassment during tenancy, um, like the person receiving notices for behavior, but then other people or tenants displaying the same behavior aren't getting those notices. And, and one example that I use often because it just sticks out in my mind is there was a gentleman who was playing loud music um, outside of his, it was audible outside of his unit, which was against the lease agreement, right? So it makes sense that he would get a notice about that. However, there were a lot of other neighbors who were also playing music that was audible outside of their units, but none of them were receiving any notices. And so it was like, why is that? And then it was discovered that this gentleman um, who is of, of a different national origin was the only person playing music in a different language. And so they had kind of been singled out because of that and they were being discriminated against because of their national origin, right? And, um, and so that's just an example of what that can look like. Um, and then uh, criminal history as a, uh, as a barrier is one as well uh, to get into stable housing. So the Department of Housing and Urban Development's given us some kind of clear guidelines about what that looks like. And basically it's that um, landlords shouldn't be saying no arrests. Um, a lot of arrests don't turn into conviction and that's really what they should be focusing on. And also be looking at things like rehabilitation and um, you know how long ago a, a crime took place uh, and take those things into consideration. So it's just a, a, a barrier in the area for folks to get into stable housing. And then, um, like I said, source of income and agency vouchers is, is a big one. Um, Sometimes it'll just be blatant, like, you know, even advertising that says uh, no Section 8. Um, and then uh, sometimes it could be, um, you know, like they uh, there's housing standards that the 
landlords have to meet in order to be Section 8, and they maybe they just won't, you know, get their units up to that, or they keep their rent just slightly higher than a voucher um, will meet, which is, um, that I wouldn't say is, is illegal, you know, but um, it is a problem in the area that source of, it, you know, folks have these vouchers and they're not able to place them. Um, and then another um, uh, bit of information that I wanted to share is from our community advisory groups, uh, which they meet regionally in the area, um, meet uh, four times a year. And these people are, they're from the housing authorities. So like all four housing, um, you know, Salem Housing Authority in Merriam County, West Valley, um, and uh, Housing Authority of Yamhill County, and then other local nonprofits and shelter providers. And they all come together and tell us like what's going on in the area, how we can focus our work and um, maybe provide fair housing materials to certain groups um, who might be experiencing more discrimination or also um, landlord resources as well. Like they're like, we think they might be you know helpful to them. So we can provide um, you know resources to landlords and get them out. Um, and what they've, they've uh, really discovered is that zoning and community acceptance issues has been a big problem when new housing is developed or is proposed. So a lot of community pushback um, around fears of who might live there. Um, criminal history, uh, we talked about as a barrier and also credit history as a barrier to get into stable housing. is really big in, in this area. And a lot of it is connected directly to disability. And um, so it could be that maybe uh, somebody lived with a disability and, and uh, you know, they were paying medical bills uh, with a credit card until they were able to start receiving some help uh, some benefits and then, um, you know, things started to stabilize, but then when they go to apply for housing, that credit history is still there, right? Um, and so it's, it's a barrier to get into housing in the area. And um, it, what we know is that if it's directly connected to a disability, people can actually write a reasonable accommodation request for that. Um, to ask a, a housing provider or landlord, especially to overlook that barrier um, because it's directly connected to a disability, which they're writing them and they're not always being met. Um, and then um, we uh, have learned that the Latinx or Latina, Latino population and the Pacific Islander community are experiencing a greater um, amount of discrimination. Um, and what we also learned from the uh, organizations that are supporting those populations is that they don't speak, uh, they don't want to report discrimination because it's scary that they could lose their stable housing. Um, they're um, sometimes they're even threatened uh, with calls from like immigration services and which is a very real fear. And so um, oftentimes they're not um, talking about what's happening and we're not hearing about it as much, which is why we make really close relationships with those organizations who are supporting um, these populations. And so that uh, we can provide them with the information and then they have a trusted relationship with folks and can give it to, uh, to their clients. So that's kind of... Uh, how we can bridge that barrier and that gap um, to the best of our ability. And um, there is also some information from um, Oregon Housing Alliance, and they are a statewide nonprofit. What they do is they collect all kinds of uh, housing information, um, and uh, they they use it to help uh, inform legislation, you know, around housing in Oregon and the needs. So um, what they discovered, it, they have this great website, which I will send out after um, to, um, I think Marty, uh, hopefully who can share it with the rest of the group that uh, they have it for every county. So very interesting to look up. Uh, so for our reason, of course, many of you probably know there's a serious lack of affordable housing in the region. For every 100 families with very low incomes, um, which is well below the median household income for the area, well below, only 28 affordable housing units exist. And so that means that 1,678 units are needed. Um, so just like a very brief glimpse of the, the big need for affordable housing and the development um, and why that is so important. Um, they also went on to talk about um, homelessness or houselessness in the in the area, and they wanted to show um, the average housing cost for a year, like the wages someone would have to earn to be able to afford a one-bedroom rental. And then they compared it with the average incomes of some folks who are living in Polk County. Um, and as you can see, if you're on social security income, veterans, pensions, retirement income, it's not gonna be meeting that fair market rent. And so it, this is just basically trying to show um, 
why building affordable housing is so important. And then it said one in 38 students experiencing houselessness, um, experienced houselessness between 2019 and 20, um, and that's 184 children. Um, and my guess is that number is, um, it's probably a bigger number um, than they have counted here. It's because it's difficult to count, to um, account for everyone who is houseless. So uh, that's their the best guess that they had though. So the reason why I wanted to bring up all of that is because I wanted to address um, what I mentioned earlier that had been identified by those community advisory groups. Um, you know, all the folks who are working at the housing authorities and the shelters and um, other nonprofits who are supporting like um, cultural groups in the area and providing them with resources. And they let us know, uh, you know, those overarching themes. And one of them was um, community pushback on new housing development. So um, we have been educating around this a lot uh, in the last couple of months. And what we know is that the a, a term has been coined for this, uh, this phenomenon, and it's called NIMBYism, which stands for not in my backyard. Um, and we would like to help break down some stereotypes around needed housing to help you combat NIMBYism in your city. Um, and it seems really hard to believe that someone in our community in this day and age would oppose the building of like an apartment building or adult foster care home um, just because of fears of who might live there. But we get uh, a lot of uh, specific discrimination complaints against housing developments every year at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. Um, and when new housing is brought up in the community, we listen for things like incompatible with neighborhood character and um, it might bring in those kinds of people, dis decreasing property values or increasing crime. And when we hear uh, those things being said, lots of times what that could mean is uh, discrimination and prejudice are influencing um, new housing development. I know that for city councils, that can put a lot of pressure on, on you. Um, and, and so it's great to learn a little bit more about those, um, the things that will come up often so that you might be able to combat some of it in the moment or just to educate in the moment and try to like bring down some of the fears. So we know that there are concerns about what housing will look like. Um, and uh, that is often, um, what, what's going to surprise a lot of community members is that affordable housing has to comply with all the same restrictions on design and construction standards as any other market rate developments, right? Which some of us at city council are on planning levels um, will know that, but a lot of community community members don't know that. They're expecting like like what they, you know, old school housing projects, you know, that do not look like what new affordable housing looks like. So um, a lot of that is based in history, those fears. Um, so uh, letting them know that cities um, have rules about how buildings are constructed and um, that new developments are held to the same standards can kind of help to alleviate that fear. Um, and there's misconception about how it's going to be maintained. Um, again, this all comes out of history because by congressional mandate, a lot of public housing early on when it was first being produced, it was not built well, it was built cheaply and it was unattractive. But what we know now is that so much has changed. And in Oregon, the emphasis has been on building very sturdy, attractive, high quality um, and high functioning housing for, a, for many, many years now. And nonprofits and public agencies that build affordable housing, they're in it for the long haul, right? Because they're not in it to flip it and make money. They're in it to provide housing for people who need it in the community. Um, there are fears about property values. And this is a tricky one because what we know is that um, it's really complicated how um, public housing can affect uh, nearby property values, and there really just aren't very many studies done on it. But one great one that we know of, it was actually done in 2005, so we know it's it's a little dated now, but it was based on 40 years of data. So it's pretty good information still, and it was, you know, authoritative review um, on 17 academic studies. And what the author concluded was, um, is that housing that was acquired and rehabilitated as affordable housing had a positive effect on nearby property values, right? So we're talking about like converting um, other housing into um, uh, affordable housing or maybe hotels and that kind of thing. Subsidized housing had no effect on nearby property values when it was cited in healthy and vibrant neighborhoods and when it was dispersed and it had responsive, responsible management, which we know it does now, right? The housing authorities work so hard to manage those properties and, um, and make sure that the folks who live there have the, what they need. 
um, negative effects on property values were likely to occur um, when affordable housing was clustered and located in declining neighborhoods, which is why it's so important to look at where we are building affordable housing. Um, because low income areas exist in, in many, many cities. You might even know of like where those areas are in your city. So when we're thinking, where are we gonna build this next affordable housing? We have to sometimes think beyond, yeah, the property might be a little cheaper there, but we're segregating families sometimes by doing that. And when negative effects do occur um, around these new housing or around affordable housing, they, uh, what they found was they were relatively small, um, especially compared to other factors that affected the property values in the area. So really it has to do with what's already going on in those communities and if you're clustering affordable housing in areas with less opportunity. Um, we see fears of increased crime, right? Um, but researchers agree that high crime rates in the areas with lots of public housing are not due to the housing itself. It has to do with the lack of opportunity in the area. Um, so if public housing is in areas with good employment, good commerce, good schools, other community resources, the crime rates uh, will be similar to the rest of the neighborhood. So we can't blame it on the affordable housing. It has to do with a lot more than that. Um, and the, the last thing that we brought up is the magnetism myth. And um, so this is another misconception, and that's that if a community builds a shelter for people who are houseless, then more houseless people will come to the area. We hear that a lot when shelters are proposed, and it's a concern um, that people are like, okay, what's what's gonna happen with the population of, of houseless or homeless people in our in our community? Um, what we know is, is that local shelters and transitional housing serve a population that already lives in our community, um, many of them lifelong or long-term residents, but the population is largely invisible now. So folks are like, wait, where are these people? Well, many of them are living outdoors in areas where we don't see them. That could be out on BLM land, camp camping out of sight, right? In our rural communities, it could mean a lot of times it's in friends or family's properties. People have more than one RV um, all together, you know, uh, using the same electricity that which can be dangerous. Um, and and so so these folks could make use of this housing, and usually when it's built, they're the they're the people who do. Um, they're all, they're in these situations because there's not enough of the kind of housing that they're they're needing. Um, and again, we have folks living in hotels, in cars, um, uh, and these families and neighbors are, are people who uh, are likely to use new uh, housing like that. Um, and so. Uh, Around free speech and public decisions, uh, community members have the right, of course, to come and express their opposition to projects on any basis, um, as long as, of course, it's not constituting, uh, it doesn't constitute illegal intimidation, which means somebody's afraid that they're going to be harmed or there's going to be injury, right? But people absolutely have the right um, to, to speak up. However, land use and other public decision makers um, are prohibited from acting favorably on requests that involve discrimination or otherwise violate fair housing law. So local officials, including staff, can only make their decisions based on fact-based, non-discriminatory factors. Um, and I know that, that that's hard because we're, we're trying to hear our community and we want to make sure that everybody is, is happy um, you know, with how everything's going in their community. So I understand that that's, even though that that's the law, that can be a difficult thing to explain. Um, but we wanted to let you know that that's what it states, you know, so um, that might help even in moments you can say, you know, like there's fair housing laws around this. Um, and it, it could help to bring that up in the moment. Um, the law prohibits the public also from asking for information about the extent or type of disability an individual or group of individuals may have who will be living in that housing. So I just, that's also something you can say is like, you know, if you have that information, you can say, I can't disclose that information. And the big takeaway here really is that, um, um, again, that, uh, with those decisions that if they're if they're discriminatory, then you don't have to make decisions based on those. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is about Section 8 vouchers in Oregon, because um, a lot of people, like I said, are discriminating against um, the protected class of source of income, and these are people who might be using these vouchers. So um, I'll provide this information to you. This is not my information. It's coming from, I believe HUD put it out, but it's a really great resource and I would love to send it. I just used their info to make a, an easy to read slide, but it has even more great stats than this. So nearly 20% of the people who are using Section 8 vouchers are, um, are 
are seniors, and that means that they can age in place. Uh, almost 30% of them are folks who are living with disabilities. 50% are people um, who are, have families with children. And then other information about it um, that people might not know is that rental assistance supports working families and 59% of non-disabled working age Oregon households that receive this kind of rental assistance, um, at least one person in the house is also working. Um, rental costs, uh, another thing that's to take into consideration is that the rental costs have risen so much, 23% uh, since 2001, and we all know like the wages are not rising to meet that. Um, and there's not enough federal assistance to go around for everyone. So um, just some important information about those Section 8 vouchers, and I'll provide that great resource after the fact. So when considering needed housing, uh, location is really important. Um, economic opportunity exists in some areas and it doesn't in others. So what we don't want to do is continue to segregate folks um, by putting all the affordable housing in one area where we know like rural communities, like transportation can be really difficult, getting um, you know, to healthcare, getting to stores, like we, uh, it's really easy to end up crazily in an agricultural farm area with no grocery stores. Uh, so it's it, the food is grown right there, but you're still in a food desert. So taking those kinds of things into consideration when we're building new housing, um, which I know is not always easy because funding is hard to find. Um, and then very quickly, uh, jurisdictions and affirmatively furthering fair housing. So where does fair housing and protected class and land use planning, where does all of that meet? How are they related? Um, it has to do with where housing is located and who lives in it um, and where the land is zoned. So like I said, is all the land for multifamily housing in one area? Um, is it spread out? Are there jobs there, libraries, that kind of thing? Um, so. Uh, counties and cities make really important decisions and they affect protected class citizens who are living in the area. Um, and something really also important to take into to consideration is these decisions last the lifetime of the building that's being built or the freeway that's being put in, maybe a freeway or an expressway or a new street, right? This can be hundreds of years. So for example, um, if high density housing, like a new apartment complex is developed in a historically low income area, it could result in families and individuals who earn less being segregated to those areas with less opportunity for the lifetime of the housing. So how many families would that affect over time, right? Who could have more opportunity if that housing had been put somewhere else? Um, and so, of course, you, uh, cities and counties are making important decisions um, about where that housing is allowed to be and where it's going to be zoned, how many people can live in there, right, ordinances, um, what kind of materials can be used, right, to build that housing that affects the cost and the tenure of the housing. Um, again, I, I said how many people are allowed to live there, occupancy, um, what kinds of tax credits that you might apply for and make avail available to developers uh, so that they can use it to uh, build more uh, affordable housing. So like uh, community development block grants or other maybe smaller government grants that could promote the building of new affordable housing could be beneficial. And then um, what kinds of allowances um, are you making or special considerations for protected class citizens? Um, for example, like I said, if somebody needs you to um, make a reasonable accommodation for a setback for a ramp, um, that should be allowed. Um, and then equitable code enforcement. Are cities applying codes in ways uh, that negatively affect some groups and maybe not others? So uh, one example of that is that we heard about a city who said, you know, the businesses in downtown, there's a lot of noise above them from the, the apartments up there. We would like to make them single occupancy only to cut down on the noise. So it was good intentions there, but what it did was it blocked families with children from using those apartments. Um, it disparately blocked one group of protected class over any other group. Um, and so that city was then asked to, to change the ordinance. Um, uh, because families need a place to live and as we know the market is pretty impacted. So affirmatively furthering fair housing is about um, addressing discriminate, uh, discriminatory actions and then working to undo the history of segregation um, and it means eradicating and preventing discrimination and segregation. Um, something to remember that I think is forgotten is that the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, They've been under the obligation to do this since 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was passed. So, um, it, you know, in many uh, 
Oregon communities, it can be hard to identify segregation because we think about it often in terms of race. But um, in Oregon, we have a lot smaller, like national average of people of color. And so it, it can, the message can kind of get lost there, but they're not thinking about segregation based on socioeconomic class, um, which there's a lot of that. You know, you, you might recognize like, oh, here's the area that's really low income in my community. Um, and often in Oregon, that is a proxy for people of color um, and of different national origins. Um, many of those folks are also um, living in poverty as well. So it's, there's overlapses and nexuses there. Um, and it, it means creating access to housing choice and access to opportunity. Um, and if you're receiving, again, federal uh, funding or community development funding, then uh, you'll have more of an obligation to um, to affirmatively further fair housing. And I would love to come back, like I said, when we have more time and share more. I hope I didn't go over time. Um, and uh, here's my contact information and just the general fair housing information. I'll send this out with resources as well, but if you wanted to take a screenshot or uh, jot it down real quick, there it is. And um, yeah, and then I, I also just have this little slide that just shows all the different like resources that I would love to send to you all after the fact. So it has a lot more detail. Sorry, we can only touch the, the tip of the iceberg right now. Um, so yeah, with that, I will, um, go ahead and end my share and we can continue on. Thank you so much, Jamie. I uh, really appreciate that and certainly the information and also the resources that are available as this is a topic we are discussing um, at length, as I know all of our fellow communities are, particularly in Polk County. So we have just a minute for a couple of quick questions. Obviously, I think if uh, we get a chance to look over those materials and some of the links that you're sending to us, we, we may have some in the future, but I'll take uh, one or two comments or questions here. Councillor Carey. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, very um, uh, interesting and informative. Um, <clears throat> one of the th things, in, and I think this is in your, you'd be able to answer this. We're having a fair amount of development go on in, in uh, the city of Monmouth right now, and much of that housing is, a mar is at market rate. And uh, we're having a hard time heretofore attracting uh, builders that are interested in uh, uh, a little more of a focus on affordable housing. Um, so I guess my question is, does it help to, you know, if, if we have these uh, developers that develop market rate homes, does that create space? Do we have people sort of trading up that might make affordable, more affordable housing options available within the community? So is there a benefit to that? Um, or do we need to just focus on affordable housing only? And that's the only way to get there. Well, you know, so here's the deal. When you're thinking about new development of, are, are we talking single family homes? Yeah, it kind of sounds yeah. like, yeah. So it's really difficult to build them that's at an affordable rate, but it's also important to remember that folks who are making less also want to uh, have opportunities to afford housing. So, um, you know, thinking of designs and maybe lot sizes and um, uh, things like that, some of those decisions can kind of help uh, to for developers to be say, okay, well, maybe with this lot size and if the ground is this, you know, this price, then yeah, it makes sense for me to try to build build develop uh, affordable housing. Um, but it is a very, I know it's a very tricky thing to find um, the funds for affordable housing. I have some really great resources around that too. I would love to share with you all. Um, and then another thing that I've been learning is just like different tax, um, programs that cities can apply for and then make available to developers um, and that part of that is like I think uh, community development block grants which depends on the, the size of your city and things but there are smaller um, uh, smaller grants that you could apply for that might help but what it ends up being is is um, usually many different funding sources coming together finding ways to close those gaps um, 
yeah, to get that affordable housing built. So, so what what it can do is, yeah, it can bring like you know great tax money and it can bring opportunities. You know, building single family homes at market rate, right? Because the people who are moving in, there those taxes are going to be, you know, improving the the community. But um, maybe thinking about in those communities, then developing affordable housing there and allowing for zoning there um, so that all of that opportunity that comes in it's not missed out on by folks who want to rent um, so and maybe um, creating um, middle housing types too is a really cool thing that people are doing like those small cottage clusters and duplexes and triplexes and all of those really open doors in those um, maybe opportunities for folks in those communities that have more economic opportunity yeah I hope that Thank answered your question. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely provide more of those resources as well. Thank you, John. One other. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate you sticking with it to try and uh, get us this information. And in fact, we, we uh, I, I know we will be in touch again as we sort through options to to really enhance our livability for families who are looking for um, opportunities to establish rent or home ownership in our communities. So thank you for that. Thank you all for having us. We look forward to coming back again. <laughs> our next presentation is actually from one of our own commissions. Our Arts and Culture Commission is with us this evening. And I do see the chair of the Arts and Culture Commission, Ellen Osborne. And uh, I will turn it over to you, Ellen. Um, your city or your staff liaison, Phyllis Bowman, and or your council liaison, uh, Councillor Lopez. So. Uh -oh. I can't hear you. I can hear you. Yep, unmute. unmute. There we go. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> and um, I'll start on an official presentation in just a second, which is kind of pre-recorded. I'm trying it that way, so I remember to do things. But I, I wanted to tell you first that um, I have some fears that I may be sharing with you, things that you already know, maybe way, way basic. The last time I shared before an esteemed assembly like this was probably the McMinnville School Board. And I had been a teacher at Columbus Elementary for about five years, um, teaching ELL. And we were called to go up and present to the board for some reason I can't remember. And so I, I stood up with a group of teachers, introduced myself. Hi, I'm Ellen Osborne. And I've been a teacher here for five years. And a little voice in my head said, Ellen, I think the school board knows the meaning of the word five. Put your <laughs> hand down. <laughs> and I kind of feel that way here, that this presentation is, is kind of basic, um, kind of things you already know, but about Monmouth, this wonderful place that we live, um, or you wouldn't be serving here. You wouldn't be spending your time like this. Um, but hopefully it'll give you some fresh insight and kind of introduce you to your Arts and Culture Commission. Um, I, it's been my privilege to serve. I'm in my fourth year, my second uh, shift. And um, I think this is the first time I've given an annual update. So I'm especially appreciative of whoever has been filling, filling that spot for me. So we're going to try this technology here. Um, Phyllis, or, or City Recorder Bowman has given us uh, some tremendous support. So let's see if we can do this. Okay. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. My name is Ellen Zuckosborn, and it is my privilege as the chair of the Monmouth Arts and Culture Commission to update the council on behalf of the commission. We could easily spend hours discussing the amazing creative community of Monmouth but I have promised our city recorder that we, we would limit our presentation to our allotted 10 minutes. As my youngest granddaughter would say, our current oh, whoa, 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 sorry guys, sorry guys. <laughs> I blew it. <laughs> so as my youngest granddaughter would say, oh, let's just go, okay. Our current commissioners, council liaison and staff support. 
I should add that a lengthier version of this presentation will be available to the council and public online. I would love to have you get to know these folks more. Locally, we like to say two cities, one community. Monmouth and our sister city, Independence, and then we add on Western Oregon University as our third community. Our rural roots and global reach define our demographics and sense of place. Amazingly beautiful farmland. International Western Oregon University students from around the globe. Our Monmouth community includes a wide diversity of people. Our mission is to provide access to the arts and culture to each individual. Our vision is to help coordinate communication between these groups so that every person is aware of and can participate in the arts and cultural opportunities available. Like the rest of the globe, COVID impacted our offerings here in Monmouth in 2020. We did have the privilege of supporting local artists and community members in some amazing events. The Art and Wine Walk, the Valley Shakespeare Company's annual summer performances, a fun 4th of July house parade, and especially exciting partnering with a new online presence for marketing so local artists, Artist Sunday. We'll be recruiting and participating again with them this fall. Our first in-person community art event it was the commission's first year of sponsoring this well-loved tradition, and it was a huge success. All ages participated. Definitely enjoyed by it all. The commission is in the process of building our infrastructure to position ourselves to apply for outside funding. One of the grants that seems especially suited to us as part of a small government entity is the Arts Build Community Grant that we learned about from Leora Sanko of the Oregon Arts Commission. Chair Osborne attended a virtual conference on statewide opportunities in Oregon on behalf of the commission. This is the fun goal, and it ties right into two of the council's priorities for the fiscal year 2021, affordable housing and economic development. In 2020, the commission and Northwest Housing Alternatives partnered to provide a beautiful work of community art by Oregon muralist Heidi Schultz. It's installed on the side of the College Manor Apartments, accessible housing in downtown Monmouth. Oregon artist Heidi Schultz was a delight and is more than willing to continue to be involved as we share her work here in Monmouth. The mural is entitled The Monmouth Oak, and Heidi's goal was to create a strong sense of place. More and more, folks are beginning to become aware of what our area has to offer. Monmouth won't be a hidden gem much longer. The city of Monmouth's survey seems very timely as we joined WU in hosting this year's Bike MS Willamette Valley event. The Arts and Culture Commission was unofficially represented by the chair volunteering for another year, this time even riding a bit after her shift. Beautiful scenery for a bike ride. Feeling pretty safe with some road signage. Yep, using the pedestrian crosswalk instead of riding in traffic like a seasoned cyclist. As my youngest granddaughter would say, we made it. So I thought we go. are almost at our destination. Just around the corner is that recently installed, soon to be much loved mural. Forgive my feeble filmmaker skills and shaky hands, always an inspiration to recruit someone from the younger generation to join us on the commission. I promise this is painful but brief. Please join me in taking a vir virtual look at the mom of oak. There it is, Heidi Schultz's amazing mural. It's very cool. So we're waiting for the QR code to give us clues about the all the hidden symbols. 
I see an owl in the hole. So look there, definitely a hornet's nest. There's a person reading or there's a live oak. The title is The Monmouth Oak. It's very cool. So an easy ride, of course, for any of our uh, visitors participating in the national MS bike event. And next year, a goal will be to make sure that they know about it. Our very sincere <laughs> representing thank you <laughs> very sincere thank you to the council <laughs> as our hidden gem of monmouth celebrates its rural roots with the world gotta have one blooper in there <laughs> or more and definitely a special personal thank you to our ever patient uh, staff support person phyllis bowman so thanks now, let's see, I don't want to leave the meeting, do I? I just want to stop sharing my screen, right, Phyllis? That's correct, Ellen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and how do I do that again? Oh, wait, 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 there it is. There it is, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it, it was rough, but um, heartfelt, so. Uh, uh, Arts and Culture Commission hopes you enjoyed our little field trip. And, um, you know, we're, we are uh, extremely proud that everyone worked together to, to pull that off during uh, COVID. So. Thank you so much, Ellen. It's, it is amazing um, how, how much you are accomplishing as a group and the talented members. Um, do we have a list of the names of your fellow commission members handy? Um, I can probably look at uh, look at that uh, screen, and so uh, I'm the chair, and then Sharon Oberst is our new new secretary, who's doing an amazing job, uh, very organized, and um, just you know minutes in great detail, which helped my brain uh, keep track of all the things that we're doing. And then we have, uh, Susan Farley, Commissioner Susan Farley, who, Susan Farley and Commissioner Jude, uh, Phipps were the commissioners that pretty much pulled off the, the, uh, community art fair. And, uh, they've, they've learned a lot and they are heading to go on to judge at the Polk County Fair. They were asked to, uh, the Monmouth Arts Culture Commission were asked to participate in the Polk County Fair, so they stepped right up and and agreed to do that, and um, are instrumental in uh, you know wanting to plan some more art events. Um, and then I think that's we we have a kind of a fluid commission. Um, we did have two uh, repeat commissioners, which was wonderful, kind of a um, you know, encore performance. Um, and then Harold Mason needed or wanted to go on and do uh, another uh, commission or board, watercolor board. And then Sue Mason uh, is delightful. And she, we are considering her our ex officio member because they both served on the Arts and Culture Commission years ago and were instrumental in getting a lot of things going in our community. So we are, um, I think we are in the process of almost filling our two empty seats again. Um, we did have a full commission for a while, but with COVID, we had some commissioners that needed to leave, leave the area um, because of their uh, careers. So we're, we're hoping to seat a full commission here real soon. And we were even talking about, can we only have, you know, do we have a limited number of commissioners or can we add more? So Phyllis, we do have openings on the Arts and Culture Commission. There are currently two openings. Great. And then we also did have another commissioner that wasn't mentioned because she likes to take the summers off. And that's oh, Tracy. Tracy. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah. And Tracy is, uh, she's one of my favorites. <laughs> not that we ever have favorites, but she's one of my favorite 
people um, because she was on the commission when I started. And um, even though she's quiet and uh, she has been such a positive support, just very, I don't know, her personality and calmness um, in the room is, is very important. So yes, I totally apologize to her. Um, but she is, she's a very valuable member. And, and we like to say, if people are thinking about joining the commission, I've, I've told people, um, you know, if you're passionate about, about the arts, um, about serving the creative community, which is everybody in Monmouth and um, helping us identify and celebrate all the diverse cultures locally. Um, if you're passionate about that, um, don't feel that you have to have endless time um, come, you know, come sit on the board and and uh, we'll work that out you know so it doesn't have to be a huge time commitment every uh, tracy for example is still a full-time uh, employee at osu which makes a difference thank you well thank you and uh, appreciate that pitch and hopefully we'll uh, connect with some folks who would like to join you for all the work coming up so yeah. thanks so much yeah. ellen for that <laughs> presentation all right, uh, we will move on to our business items. We have several readings and um, adoptions. Our first one this evening was the first reading of an ordinance regarding a, um, a land use uh, issue or right away issue. And I think Suzanne Duffner, our community development director, is here to remind us of that. Okay, thank you, Mayor, and uh, good evening to members of the council. Uh, so we have first reading tonight to adopt a uh, ordinance for a street vacation of an unused piece of uh, street right of way uh, known as Alberta. It's between Sacred Lane and Powell Street. Uh, you did have a public hearing on this um, on July 6th. At the close of that, um, the recommendation from the council was, or the decision by council was to approve that. So this ordinance is coming back to finalize that and make that uh, official through adoption. Um, the uh, street vacation can meet our criteria and the state criteria uh, for being uh, as a vacation of public right of way, we just need to make sure that we've retained a, a public utility easement since there are uh, utilities located within that uh, right of way. So uh, you will see uh, attached to the staff report is an ordinance. I apologize, it got a little out of order. The exhibits came first and then the ordinance came, but it's all there. And uh, we've got the legal description of the area that's being vacated as well as a map. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about that. Um, but yeah, again, this is the actions first reading on it. Okay, any questions? Uh, again, as she mentioned, this is just the ordinance language. Thank you to our attorney, Lane Shetterly, for providing that. And unless there are any concerns or questions or changes, this isn't what we thought we were getting. Um, Seeing none, I will declare first reading of ordinance number 1401, an ordinance vacating a certain portion of the public right of way identified as Alberta Avenue located between Sacred Lane North and Powell Street East. And that will come back to us for a second reading and adoption. So thank you for that. And you're just, you're just on tonight, Suzanne, so. Okay. On a roll. <laughs> All right. So, for just a brief introduction, that uh, you have before you second reading of ordinance number 1399. Uh, this is to adopt an amendment to the city's side yard setbacks in the low density residential zone to reduce those from 15 feet to 10 feet. Um, we have held a public hearing on July 6th, um, the close of which there was a, a decision to approve that. So, that, again, this is the ordinance to make that official and adopt it. First reading was held on July 20th, and then you have the ordinance attached tonight. Uh, it does include uh, a declaration of an emergency to make it immediately um, effective instead of waiting the 30 days um, that's included in the, in the packet there. So 
Um, and there's also a sample motion for that uh, when you're ready for it. Great, thank you. Again, this is similar to what we've already seen. And uh, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Well, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and state it just in case. Uh, I would propose that uh, we approve ordinance 1399 and ordinance adopting amendments to chapter 18.50 of the Mon Zoning and Development Ordinance relating to low density residential zone side yard setback requirements. This is legislative amendment 21-01 and declaring an emergency. Second. Thank you, Councillor Oberst, for the motion and Councillor Lopez for the second. Are there any questions or comments? Councillor McKeel. I just wanted to say thank you to the council and mayor. Uh, I did actually have several conversations with residents in Monmouth over the last couple of weeks. And while I did have somebody who hotly said, no, five feet is too small, kind of felt the way I did, I had actually many more conversations with people about this is good for sustainability and this actually allows the city the flexibility to bring in more housing that's needed. So uh, thank you very much. And I think it actually has affected how I would uh, vote on this. So. Thank you, Carol. Seeing no other comment. Uh, just, just, just a quick one. Um, this is for Suzanne. Um, you know, I, sh I, I, I should know this. So I'm sort of embarrassed to ask it, but but for a yard adjoining a street, it's 10 feet. Is that is that where the side lot is like adjoins the 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 street the public right of way as opposed to coming in perpendicular uh so it, it's a corner lot is what that's referring to right so a corner lot has um frontage on two streets uh and so it's saying you know the the front of the house where the front door faces has the 15 foot setback and then that street corner side uh, yard has to be 10 feet, so a little bit more room there because of the street and the easement. Mm -hmm. So we're not okay. changing that with this ordinance. That would stay the same. Okay. And, and I would remind, uh, I, I had a I had a, a person um, uh, who um, had some, uh, voiced some objection to this, but in the end was uh, assaged by my um, uh, explanation of it, I guess, um, and her concern was the, the the reduction of lot size, difficult to get trees, uh, you know, all of those sorts of of things that go along with. It. Of course, she's a gardener, um, and and I did um, remind her that it was per this is permissive legislation. This is not prescriptive, so. Um, there's not a requirement that we build up to five feet. It, that, that's just, again, they're permitted to go that should they, they, they wish to, the developers. So, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Good comment. Thank you, Councillor Kerry. And, and, and Councillor uh, Lopez. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, uh, I, I'd just like to take a moment to, to highlight um, some of the larger uh, and long lasting implications of, you know, small uh, or seemingly small um, ordinances such as this and small changes. As, uh, as was uh, just, uh, just presented in um, the fair housing presentation, um, these structural changes and decisions that we make have very long lasting um, impacts. And uh, I'll, I'll highlight one that was made previously here in, in the town of Monmouth. Um, you know, a, a decision at one point not to require um, sidewalks be built in front of certain, uh, certain homes in certain parts of town. And um, that's changed the character and uh, the livability of this town for, a long, for, for the long run. I feel that this, in the way that it's been written um, as permissive legislation, will take our town forward in ensuring that um, more affordable housing units are able to be built in the future. 
and um, I really, uh, really appreciate uh, appreciate um, staff's um, work on this, and appreciate council's consideration of this. Great, thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, Phyllis, could we please get the roll call for ordinance number thirteen ninety nine? Councillor Oberst. Uh, yes. Councillor Carey. Aye. Councillor Salinas Oliveros. Aye. Councillor McKeel. Yes. Councillor Lopez. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you very much. And uh, now to Marty Wine, we'll uh, talk about our agreement with Spectrum Charter Communications. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Good evening. Um, you have for your consideration tonight the renewal of the franchise with um, Spectrum Charter Communications. This is Ordinance 1400, and it's um, you had a first reading of the ordinance at your last meeting in July, the July 20th. Um, at that time, I went through in some depth the provisions of this franchise. The highlights are substantially as you saw them as it was presented. Um, we're proposing a 10-year franchise with Charter. The key issues related to the franchise have to do with um, uh, the uh, PEG, Public Educational and Government Channel, and uh, whether or not a fee will be charged by, by Charter. And I think um, one of the reasons that we're bringing you, I'm bringing you a, a, um, a franchise that's unchanged from first reading is that I know that the concern that you expressed um, when you were when you saw first reading was about parity uh, for this agreement with our other cable provider MyNet, and what I have to offer you in that regard is that our franchise um, our franchise with MyNet is also expired, and it's a it's on the agenda for the MyNet board to be taking up a renewal of that agreement as well. And so what I'll look for in our negotiations with MyNet would be to 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 put together a substantially similar franchise that's on par and also to work with the Winpeg board to um, put the their strategic plan in place so that streaming of our public educational and governmental channel can happen in the future. So um, I'm trying to think if there are other terms that I wanted to mention regarding um, this agreement, but I think that those were the highlights. And I would also welcome any other questions that you have after your prior discussion. And you have a draft motion if you're so inclined. Right. So, so are we accepting a second reading or are we moving? The, our second readings are our adoption. Okay. So, yeah. The motion would be the second reading and adoption of, and then all the giant language there. Well, to, 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 so we can frame discussion, um, I'll move uh, the second reading and adoption of ordinance 1400 relating to cable system services in the city of Monmouth and granting to Spectrum Pacific West LLC doing business as charter communications, a non-exclusive franchise to construct, operate, and maintain a cable system within the city creating new provisions, repealing ordinance 1184 and existing franchise uh, dated February 4th, 2003, um, ordinance uh, 1175 and ordinance 1184 and all prior conflicting ordinances. Second. Thank you, Councillor Kerry, for the motion, and Councillor Salinas Oliveros for the second. And yes, aforementioned discussion may commence. Right. Um, it, it, I just is this, you know, because we focused on these uh, on these particular the peg channel and the peg fee. Um, quite honestly, I didn't look in detail at the remainder of it. But can we assume that that's a, a you know a pretty standard franchise agreement for this type of a yes it is so we came to substantial agreement with charter several years ago on all of the other terms of the franchise and that has to do with their operation in town their cabling and the system and how they'll install equipment 
the franchise fee. So it it looks like it, it's 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 a I would call it a standard yeah. uh, franchise agreement in I, all the I, other I sort respects. Of, I sort of assume that. Um, you know, the the I have um, trouble on two levels with this. Uh, we have language that. Uh, you know, and I'm concerned so that we shouldn't with 400 customers, we ought not to require them to, to you know, pay the amount of money they would in order to get a, a big channel up. I, so I'm totally on side with that. Um, how, and, and there is language that would allow the city to request them um, uh, to add a peg channel should, you know, conditions change. Um, that's especially given their history that's pretty iffy in terms of you know well we you know they'd say well you're just feeling like it monmouth and you want to make us put a peg channel up there and, and so i you know i wonder if there's not and it's probably too late at the moment but if there's not a threshold that that would trigger them so there really would be very little or I suppose the city could still be, you know, well, we're not going to ask you to do this. You got a thousand customers now, um, but if you if you hit that benchmark, you got to act like everybody else. And and to me, that would take some of the um, argumentation out of it. Um, and we could set it as high as we want, but I just think there ought to be a threshold rather than a uh, what could be conceived as an arbitrary request that would harass uh, arguably them and um you know i'm still troubled with the with the uh, uh with no peg fee uh you know they, they've they've uh, i mean and and if we're going to roll back monument or mine that i'm sorry then um you know we could certainly go back and rescind one that might be included here but to go forward and say well we're going to Let's assume we stay with it with that, and the board wants that at my net. So, as a my net customer, I'm paying an extra buck. Um, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, we can rescind in the other direction, but it's hard to add as we've learned with these people. Uh, so, that, so those, those are my two issues. Um, for now. Yeah, I think, John, the two, the two things there one is they refused to sign it with the peg fee. That's what's held up the renewal for all this time. Um, and secondarily, it, it partially relied on this sense that they didn't have a lot of customers here. But secondarily, it relies on changes in technology. And if you say, by the time you get up to X number of customers, we, we want to look at a peg fee. Imagine what the technology changes will be at that time. So I'm not sure that I I, I just really think as the, as this thing is dragged out and, and another 10 year agreement, we don't know what those changes are going to look like. I really don't anticipate that we'll be able to get any additional concessions out of them at all. Yeah, and, and I understand that. I, it, it's just inconceivable to me that uh, that they would not be willing to uh, operate a pass through one dollar fee. Um, it, it, well, yeah, I mean, I would say that I, I think that given both the low customer, low number of customers, and the relative amount of the bill, passing through a dollar fee would make their service that much more expensive. And it is a pass through. So to your point, it's not you know. It's not like they're paying the fee. It's that the the subscriber is paying the fee. But I think that it, you know, in terms of in terms of the affordability of the service, adding a dollar is probably it probably seems like a lot to someone who's getting that bill. And to go, I want to remind or I want to rewind a bit to something else that you said at the beginning. And I think that um, requesting a channel in their lineup and also asking for a peg fee. In both cases, um, the cable operator has uh, the, uh, they are, they will ask us to demonstrate our channel's relevance, our, you know, the amount of programming and, and um, you know, the value of that program, programming to the community. 
And I think that um, we would have some work to do to be able to, uh, I'll just say prove to them that, um, that that channel would be worth carrying in their lineup. And so there, those we would have to go through those steps if we uh, were to insist that that the channel be carried. Yeah, I'm I'm not concerned with their their putting that you know putting a peg channel up. Um, just should they get to that point, that was my only deal. Yeah. And uh, the and as the mayor mentioned, the technology is such that streaming the channel is possible, and as long as that's true, um, having you know going through going through a you know a big investment on either party's side to to either carry the channel or to invest in our peg channel is it isn't really indicated john <clears throat> councillor oberst so uh to sort of wrap this into a bigger picture right now charter doesn't carry our peg channel because we aren't sending them the signal for them to carry because we don't have the equipment to send them the signal so why would they collect a peg fee for something they don't have and the reason they don't have the equipment that we don't have the equipment is because the original equipment bought when when uh when peg was set up is dead and expensive and they have declined to purchase new and we can't afford new so it's really kind of a moot point at this point because they don't have a signal to put up if we wanted to no way to get them one well, but equipment that we would buy with a peg fee could provide that. <laughs> it would take many, many years of yeah. the peg fees we would get from Charter to ever afford the piece of equipment to send the, well, the, the, the digital yeah. signal over there to them. It, it's just, it becomes a, a, an endless chase and one I don't think that we'll ever track down, basically. So. Councilor McKeel? Yeah, um, I, I went to um thank miss wine for actually my concern which was the equity between my net and charter um or spectrum charter I, I went actually looked on the internet and found that um spectrum charter is a little cheaper they so i my concern was to provide this one dollar subsidy thing for but i think if we allow my net the same equity in uh in their in their contract i i'm fine with this we just shouldn't have like something for my net and not for spectrum charter all right seeing no further discussion uh and this is ordinance number one four zero zero so phyllis will see how this goes take the roll call please councillor Kerry. no councillor mckeel yes councillor lopez yes councillor salinas oliveros yes councillor oberst yes Motion passes 4-1. Okay. Thank you very much. And back to Suzanne, I believe, for um, a very exciting development, our sort of official entree into the Oregon Main Street program. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Mayor, for that introduction. So I am very pleased tonight to bring forward um, a letter, draft letter of support from the City of Monmouth and City Council. Um, this is to support the Monmouth Business Association's application to the Oregon Main Street program to join the program at the exploring level. Um, the Oregon Main Street program, just real briefly at a high level, is um, a nationwide um, proven program that helps communities uh, revitalize and improve their downtown areas. And they do it in a really um, great ground up um, from you know grassroots type of uh, work with your community members, volunteers, and build on your community's unique assets and preserve your historic resources to do that. So uh, really excited about that. Um, this will open up to uh, technical assistance and even some grant funds. So uh, it's a great thing um, to, uh, to participate the exploring level, I listed in the memo some of the requirements, and one of them is demonstrated support of the local government. So that's the purpose of, of this letter of support tonight. 
um, and then there are some other program requirements so it's um, exploring levels it sounds is kind of that entry level so the commitments are, are still pretty low in terms of attending some training and um, doing an annual report so we believe we have the capacity to do that through the business association and the city of course since it's consistent with the goals of our economic development strategy uh, will be there to to help and assist as well so good news there's no fee uh, to, to join so that's always nice um, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about it I believe Councillor Obers will have a comment and then Councillor McKeel my only comment is this would be the second time Monmouth has joined exploring the first time it was half-heartedly without any real support from the MBA. And I'm excited at this opportunity. I have been an advocate of this program for 20 years. And I know that it can do great things and that if we will truly engage it and work our way up to the various levels, it can we can benefit as a community and as a business community from this step. I'm all in favor and would love to make a motion when the time comes. Councilor McKeel. Well, I am going to yield to Councillor Oberst because I was going to make the motion, but he has a track record of this and is very passionate about it. So I am going to uh, <laughs> yield the motion to Councillor Oberst. More, more importantly than that, let me say that um, his sister-in-law, uh, sister, sister, sorry, his sister Mary Oberst was actually um, the leader and. Uh, of the Oregon Main Street program for many years. She has been very involved in this program and I thank you for yielding. He will appreciate the honor. Um, Oregon had a program, Oregon's program died. And when my sister was first lady, she uh, asked to be put back into the governor's budget. He forced her to go to the legislature herself to argue for its readoption as a program in the state of Oregon. So uh, she she has been awarded on a national level from the Main Street program for her efforts. And yeah, I'm excited about this. I have moved approval of a letter of support for the Monmouth Business Association to submit an application to join the Oregon Main Street program. I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Obers for the motion and Councillor McKeel for the second. And any additional comments or questions? All in favor of sending our letter of support, please signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? Aye. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, was that an opposition or you were just late getting to your? I think I have a little bit of lag. My, my apologies. That was an aye. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, and any opposed then? Hearing none. I am delighted to be able to sign this letter since I didn't get to vote, but at least I get to sign the letters. <laughs> A good letter. Of Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne, <clears throat> for your work and Marty and your work with MBA as we move into this. Um, join, join the many communities who benefited from the Main Street program. So that's great. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Um, that takes me to my report, and I have uh, one couple of things um, that, uh, I guess one big thing, uh, the last few days from um, last Thursday until Sunday, I was in attendance at the Oregon Mayor's Association Conference um, on Oregon's Adventure Coast. So that's what my little mask is all about. Uh, <laughs> the cities of Coos Bay and North Bend hosted at the Mill Casino. And these um, opportunities to meet with our colleagues, uh, elected officials from around the state to, to convene and network and and learn from them are so valuable. Um, I was honored to serve on the planning committee for this event and to actually, I did a presentation with the fellow mayor of North Plains and we talked about networking, building your leadership network and um, mentoring. And um, the theme of the conference was about unity 
uh, uh, many mayors have very different uh, viewpoints and ideas and politics, but <clears throat> we talked about leadership, we talked about governance, and talked about ways to move our state forward together as a group and uh, appreciate that. And I just also want to say we had a, I had the opportunity uh, to introduce folks to Polk County's newest mayor uh, as Jeremy Gordon, the mayor of Falls City steps down because he was appointed to serve as um, a Polk County commissioner to replace the retiring Mike Gainsworth. The Falls City uh, Council has selected TJ Bailey as the new mayor and he was there and it was a great opportunity to introduce him to folks and here are some of the great ideas that TJ has certainly as a member of the staff of the Central School District. TJ is really excited and looking forward to ways to connect more with Monmouth um, Dallas and Independence <clears throat> and uh, that was a great opportunity. So my segue from here is that registration opened today for the League of Oregon Cities statewide conference. That conference will be October 21st to 23rd in Bend. And um, we are fortunate enough to be in a position that the city can assist uh, counselors. We'll cover our registration and lodging to that event. So Phyllis, will um, be getting information out or you can reach out to her if you are interested in attending the League of Oregon Cities Conference because I know we all come away with so much good information and, and energy and enthusiasm, both about the work we're already doing and the work that's available to us. So see Phyllis about that. And, and yeah. I, would, I would urge council if you can go, if there's any way you can get involved in this it's a fabulous opportunity to network with other cities and learn what other cities are doing so you get yourself over there do yep. um that takes us to reports of uh the activities of our boards and commissions so do we have any reports this evening to share about their great work uh councillor lopez yes thank you and um I'll, uh, I'll, I'll echo um, uh, Mayor Coons and uh, Councillor Oberst's uh, words about uh, the value of um, of this gathering. You know, it is uh, is an incredible opportunity to learn from other communities, um, learn from uh, other elected leaders, and in in these chambers, we often find ourselves asking, you know. Well, how how do how do neighboring communities ha handle this? How do other uh, um, other uh, you know cities in Oregon that are about our size um, handle X, Y, and Z? And this is the opportunity to really build relationships to be able to answer those questions. Um, I'll uh, I'll share that um, I am on the uh, organizing committee this year um, through my involvement with the. Um, uh, through the uh, People of Color Caucus, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to to putting together a safe and fun and uh, enriching event. So, um, really, uh, really hope that uh, all that are able to are um, are coming out. Um, I'd also like to like to share um, a uh, little bit about uh, a little bit about our Arts and Culture Commission. Um, thank you very much, Chair Osborne, for for the wonderful uh, for the wonderful report. Um, one uh, one thing that I'd like to highlight is just the amount of energy, the amount of steam, the amount of excitement that is alive in this commission right now. And um, I, I have not been on uh, on this commission for very long myself, um, just since uh, the beginning of the year. But uh, but but I am extremely enthused to be you know to, to be able to watch this uh, this wonderful group of people you know grow in the common pursuit of making art and culture these things that are often these intangibles um, you know more available to our community that really enrich the city in uh, in ways that 
uh, is is difficult to uh, is difficult to stress enough. Um, then I'd, I'd also like to share that I missed the last uh, the last MyNet meeting, um, and and I'll share with you why it's uh, it's sobering news. Um, we had a COVID scare in my family. Uh, there was a um, there was a uh, um, uh, known exposure, and uh, this was a known exposure through someone who is vaccinated. And we are all vaccinated, but um, out of an abundance of caution, um, I spent uh, I spent my day getting tested twice uh, because uh, the the first test was uh, was inconclusive. So um, very fortunately, we are uh, you know we are all safe and healthy. Um, and uh, those came back negative, but I, I would urge everyone to, um, you know, as uh, as Mayor Koons uh, began this meeting, uh, to to really um, be very careful in in all of our interactions. The the, the vaccine works, but it is not, um, you know, it is uh, not, uh, you know, a magic wand. And um, the this is this is still here, and it's uh, it's still real. So. Um, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for your ears and your time. Thank you, other boards and commissions. What? Planning Commission had a week off? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I am very fortunate that on the 27th, I was able to attend a meeting of the Senior Advisory Board. That group is uh, strong and going and very excited to begin their foray into in-person um, classes and meetings. Again, they will be exercising great caution, but they have been able to start their card groups, their yoga group, their writer's workshop um, and knitting group, um, as well as some exercise. They're hoping to be able to offer um, more social events, not the breakfast yet, we're not quite there, but um, they are really looking at those. <laughs> uh, the, the Senior um, Center has been for many, many years an, a place where seniors could receive care um, for their feet. Uh, obviously an issue folks who are diabetic or pre-diabetic and many seniors lack the mobility to be able to care for their own feet and they had someone coming in on an appointment basis uh, the person who did that is no longer available so if we know of anyone who provides that care and is able to work at the senior center on a regular basis to assist uh, please have them contact Barbara Cronin at the Senior Center. Um, but uh, had a really great discussion about the Senior Center mission and how they are restructuring some of their committees. They are looking at um, having a, a, to really beef up the work of their diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, making sure that they are doing a better job of outreach to so many seniors in our community that are more isolated and by virtue of potentially uh, protected status, um, minority status, ethnic status, haven't been as included in their events. And I was really heartened to hear a robust discussion about how we're gonna do that. Uh, one more thing. <laughs> The air conditioning was out at the old part of the building of the senior center. So they were, we were struggling a little bit that day. And uh, it's, uh, as you can imagine, air conditioning HVAC folks are a little busy. Hopefully we'll be able to get that fixed and get back in there. Um, they're also looking at new software that will not only create a membership management system for them, but folks will be able to sign up for classes online and will allow um, touchless uh, scanning for folks to sign in and out of activities. So it's a busy time there and I really appreciate my opportunity. I will also invite folks to who are interested in moving Senior Center uh, forward. They have three openings on their board and. The, there are no age requirements or limits to assist in the senior advisory boards. So 
if you're interested in that same place city website application or folks can reach out to me about the or barbara cronin about the work they do so that was the senior advisory board and if there are no others Uh, Marty, City Manager's Report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I have two items of good news. Um, I always like reporting good news. So uh, on, on our City Hall project, we have been working together with Western Oregon University to invite them and secure their services to be our owner's representative for the City Hall project. And that came from a fairly simple idea, but a good one, which is we said, we've got this neighbor and partner who builds buildings and does a good job at it, and we need a building. So um, it's great news, and so we're gonna enter into an intergovernmental relationship with an agreement with the university and the facilities division, and so the head of the de facilities department at WU will be our, our construction project manager. So I'm planning to sign that agreement as soon as we come to terms, and I'm hoping that's pretty soon. And with that, we'll have our construction team assembled and substantially in place, and we'll be able to secure a general contractor and get the project bid. So my hope is that we'll be uh, moving dirt around and demolishing buildings by end of year. But we're very excited for um, Wu's willingness to be able to work with us on our project. Um, some of you might have caught in the Friday notes that um, the pricing of our bonds for City Hall will be coming up on August 10th. And we are really pleased to report that our bond rating received an upgrade from Standard & Poor's. So I thought I'd announce it again that we had an, um, we we have moved from an A plus uh, rating to a double A minus, and that's a that's a reflection of a couple of strong economic and other um, indicators with debt at minus and so on. So it's great news, as well as good management mm -hmm. by our finance yeah. and administrative staff. I would say over time, Monmouth's fiscal management and prudence has, um, you know, it really shows in this ratings upgrade. So so credit to everyone who contributed to that over time. Um, and then you'll be hearing from me about scheduling together, a, I'm gonna call it an advance, or instead of a retreat, we'll come up with another name for it. But the council later in the fall, I'm gonna be looking for um, times for you to all get together to do some longer term visioning, talk about your council rules. And, um, and so I'm, we're thinking that that might be in the later uh, October, probably timeframe. So, and it will help us also set the course for our some of our budget and planning. That's what I've got. And I really enjoyed reading, believe it or not, enjoyed reading the Standard and Poor's report. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, that was that was really nice to stuff to read about our fair city. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> Um, and at this time, if we have any additional council comments, I will entertain those and Councilor McKeel. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to make note that on July 26th was the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Acts, Act. Uh, I'm always a little behind in uh, making note of that, but I think it's an important, a very important piece of legislation that has had dramatic change across our country and in our community and still work to do but it was a good it was a good step thank you councillor selena solivaros yes thank you mayor coons i just want to uh, bring to everybody's attention september 15th through october 15th is hispanic heritage month and the reason i am mentioning it is because um we're working on putting together some community engagement events for the entire month. One of them is a project that myself and Audrey Caro, who uh, was, uh, used to be a reporter, and we are looking at, and we're, we are partnering with um, OCDC, with, uh, with Odi Campos, with Western Oregon University, and we are looking at, um, really focusing on migrant farm workers who live in our area and and displaying some public art around um, Monmouth and Independence. And really these are photographs that we're looking at, uh, photographing hands and uh, doing some interviews, telling some stories. And so that is uh, in the works. 
And then uh, Councillor McKeel is assisting in organizing um, bilingual uh, story time readings in Monmouth Park and in Independence. And we've uh, involving both of the libraries and we would love to have our council members, this is an invitation to um, uh, assist and volunteer on some of those Saturdays to come out and help um, if, you know, if we have some uh, refreshments or uh, crafts for the kids, we'd love to involve our council members in this as well. Um, so that so we're just trying to create some community engagement opportunities to enjoy. So we will uh, keep you informed and share information with you. I I do I will share information with Phyllis uh, to share with you. There was a wonderful study that was completed on migrant farm workers here in Oregon, 300 of them, and it, there's some great information in that study. And there's also a video because this year the Hispanic Heritage Award has gone to our farm workers and it's a wonderful video and interviewing uh, families and individuals. So I will also send that to you. Great. I just wanted to, if I could, sorry. Uh, uh, we'll be sending out information for the community notes so we can publicize this. So far we have Police Chief Haynes who has tentatively agreed to read a story and um, but if he can't make it, there'll be a police officer there from Monmouth. We have fire chiefs, uh, uh, Ben Stang. I'm sorry, I realized I don't know how to say his last name. And he's going to also read a story and he may be able to read this story in Spanish as well because he speaks Spanish. So, and we have had our very honorable mayor who has tentatively agreed and Mayor McArdle. So, we're uh, now looking at asking a couple elementary school principals to read a story on, uh, and um, Councillor Salinas Oliveros has selected four stories. So there'll be one uh, be read in English and read in Spanish. And then uh, so far Independence Library has committed to help with the craft. And I'm in, uh, we're paying, I'm playing phone tag with Monmouth Library, so I'm sure they will too, but uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't commit. To, to, to them but uh yeah it looks like it's going to be it's going looks like it's going to be a really four great events thank you any other comments you got some john Councilor yeah. um just and last time i i noted that that uh, i'm going to put together sort of a proposal for some video things youtube things that would enhance and support our community engagement value. I will do that, but what I would ask counselors to do, if you have a topic that you would like to include, um, you know, we don't want an exhaustive one, but we would like to have, you know, some of the basics. And I'm I'm reviewing what's what's out there right now and I'll have some ideas and I, I promise I'll provide a uh, a bit of a report on that in writing. Uh, a question then um, have we been involved in this, Marty and Cecil would be for you. Have we been involved in engaging with the university regarding their reopening plans? Are we up to speed on that? And they up with us? I I I can say the board of trustees is required to get a report from the president at each of our board meetings regarding that. So I, I have been following that closely all along. Uh, the next board meeting will be September 10th. So that's when they'll be finalizing their sure. opening plans. Yeah. And beyond the mayor's report, I know that um, Suzanne Duffner has been involved with the new student, the, the student visits that are happening now. But beyond that, I, if we have more that we need to be involved in or learn about, I. Uh, you know, I don't have any. I, it's just more of a question. I mean, arguably there's going to be 4,000 new people coming to campus from all over the place. And I know they've got, you know, I know they're hoping to have vaccination requirements and no, they have and and hopefully that stays and vaccine. then perhaps masking. I guess I wonder about uh, events, which, the, you know, uh, well, we, we can have a report from Rebecca Childs yeah. um, and the new interim president. 
Jay Kenton uh, is in town, and perhaps it would be good to have him introduce himself to us. This is a, uh, a perfect example of why we need to enhance that relationship. Uh, I mean, the decisions they make will impact, you know, what um, our citizens will experience, good and bad, and and, and it's all going to be good if they we get the students here. But I, I guess that's that's uh, yep. uh, just it would be a good outreach, perhaps. And then uh, the last thing, and I don't want to go too far on it, but you know, we, we have the now as part of our official agenda, the. Uh, native land statement is that our official position a, a land acknowledgement is is literally that it is the information his about the historic um status of the land we are on and the tribes that inhabited this land and <clears throat> whose native rights to this land are acknowledged um, it is something the state of Oregon does now at many of their meetings. Uh, a lot of public bodies do. So, um, is it an official position or statement? No. I mean, it's appearing on our agenda. I guess is the reason I asked. I, I, I asked for that. Uh, our counselors were reading at each meeting, sure. and so I think it's an important thing to say we're conducting this business um, on this property on this land and. It, it will just remain there as, as a statement, as an acknowledgement. We won't read it each time. But. Okay. Thank you. Did you have something, Councilor? Yes, I did. And I think you're aware of this, uh, Marty. Oh. So. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, as many of you, I think, are aware, or some of you are aware, I've had the good fortune to be a member of a leadership group in the state called the American Leadership Forum of Oregon. And uh, a few years ago, I guess it's about two and a half years ago now, they started a project um, trying to explore the rural urban divide in Oregon. Uh, this project started with a small group traveling the state, talking to uh, people around to find out what are the things that we really have in common across that divide. And uh, from there, from that came a larger group that got together and tried to drill down and it wound up identifying three areas to explore. Um, equity, diversion and inclusion being one, uh, broadband and its uh, availability or not uh, being another, and uh, uh, some questions around Oregon's land use policies. And I wound up working on that land use piece. Um, the the uh, place that my group came to was the idea that there are a whole lot of voices that are not heard in Oregon's land use process, and how to how we got at that finally um, in the middle of a pandemic it was a bit of a trial but we put together a video, and it's a short video um, it it is. Uh, I hope everybody enjoys it. I think it's a, a really nice piece. Um, I have information to the uh, for a link to the entire project if anybody is interested in exploring not only this piece, but the diversity piece and the broadband piece as well. It's, it's really been well put together. Um, I think highly of this group and I think highly of the product that we've managed to come out of, as I say, despite the pandemic. So I think Phyllis has the link to this video available and, um, with that, I will. Uh, we, I, I do want to say, we made a point of getting out and finding the very best people in the state to be in our video. And was the hope that it would be shown tonight? Yes. Yeah. So, Phyllis, if you could please cue up the video, that would be great. Stand by. Thank you. If you're in, you're in trouble. No, he's not. In it. No. <laughs> no, I I my, recognize. my name is in it, and that's all, John. You'll recognize someone in it, but it's not him. Well, after he pumped up the best people in Oregon, you know, I think. Well, wait till you see. You'll agree. Uh oh. Well, we'll give her a, another few seconds to get yeah. that shared and go, and otherwise we may have to put it off. For... <clears throat> now the buildup, because the anticipation that we would see it another time. <laughs> 
There we go. <clears throat> audio, audio. I yeah, I can't hear it. Can't hear it. There's any way you can start it back to the beginning, it'd be good. Yeah, there we go. Don't let it play too far. You're going to give away my surprise. All right. There she is. <laughs> Woohoo. <laughs> like I said, all the best people oh, are. Yes. Yeah, I think Phyllis, why don't you go ahead and pause it since we cannot hear the audio on it? And does Phyllis, do you have uh headphones on? Because I heard that messes up the sound sometimes. I do not have headphones on. Uh, okay. Let me try this and let me tell me if you hear it. Is that balance between non farm uses? Do you want me to start it over? Yes, yes please. please. Okay. You and I say we love Oregon more than anyone. We love Oregon as much as anyone. We fought today in our deliberations to come. Must spring from our determination to keep Oregon lovable and to make it even more livable. The original Senate Bill 100 was in the early 70s, and the idea behind it was to try to arrest what was then called urban sprawl. People saw a lot of growth in Oregon and did not want to lose those very special places, and the basis of a lot of the rural economies in forestry and agriculture. You want residential lands, um, you want commercial lands and industrial lands so you can live and work and play in the same area. It's a challenge. Is that balance between non-farm uses, providing urban growth space for both commercial and industrial and housing needs inside the city. That's the fight that the land use system has. The origins of land use historically were really around excluding certain people and predominantly excluding people by race. We don't tend not to think of it that way today. We tend to think of it as this way to organize our communities. We have a lot of people who don't understand the original reason for Oregon's land use laws. We have a lot of people who are staunch defenders of Oregon's land use laws, and that creates a room full of angst. It's tough to get farmers to put their shovel down and, and get involved in the political process. Citizen participation is really hard to get, and agriculture needs to get our story out. The land use system locks out this whole part of our community who was denied that opportunity to build generational wealth, the opportunity for home ownership, which is what we think of as the American dream in every community across this country. If we have a system that is built on those inequities, we ought to consider whether or not it continues to perpetuate those inequities. There are also some of the issues that may have not been foreseen when the laws were initially developed. And actually, by the latest numbers that we did, about 75% of our land supply is outside of our city limits. Uh, and not able to, to urbanize. And so we're starting to see a crunch on what can be developed. The challenges for these small counties, small cities, is the ability to have staff to implement the program. Many of the small cities have a part-time or maybe a full-time city administrator that doesn't probably have the expertise or the time, just the, the time to be able to spend to work through some of those problems. What I would like to see new in land use planning, how it could change over time. It's important that we have citizen participation at the county planning level. We're really fortunate when we have young farmers who are willing to go out and serve and be on the planning commission or testify in Salem to how, what happens to the rules and regulations that affect their farm. The advice I have for people who feel like they're not being heard is learn how to listen, get involved. It can help you become a little bit more well-rounded in your community and it can help you understand the trials and tribulations that, for example, the government workers are going through in your community. I would encourage people to volunteer for your city or county planning commission, get involved with the program. You can talk with your local legislators, talk with your local elected officials, and um, work on improving the policy. 
we definitely have a concern about whether or not all voices are being heard. I think it's through a lot of trust building that folks learn their voice can be heard and does make a difference. I think there is some translation that needs to happen and some skilling up that needs to happen and bring those folks along that feel like they've been excluded from both the land and the processes for so long. So folks who are trying to be heard or who don't even know that they should be heard, keep raising your voice and keep in the processes and demand that we be heard. Tarragon is an inspiration. Whether you come to it or are born to it, you become entranced by our space duty, the opportunity she affords, and the independent spirit of her citizens. And I felt like this was particularly nice that we had the report from the fair housing folks, Alan Lazo in Portland is uh, very involved in that organization. And um, as we head into our code review, I'm hoping that citizens will understand that this being involved doesn't just mean being on the planning commission. Uh, far too often people come in at a hearing and it's too late, the rules are cast. This is an opportunity to get involved, and I would ask council to talk to folks that you know who you think would be good to be involved in this process to shape the future of our city and, and what's going to be built where and so on by being involved in the code review process. Because once that is done and we have the new rules, it's too late to make those uh, impacts when somebody makes a land use proposal and they're under the rules that are in place. You know, that, that's what we have to live with. So uh, get involved make your voice heard because that's the way we're going to uh, have the city we all want to have and thanks for allowing me to show this video tonight madam mayor uh, madam manager i hope everybody enjoyed it i will forward the link to the overall project to everyone so you can see it's good stuff all the the other two projects are also really good it wasn't suzanne wonderful yes thank you suzanne all right at this time, then, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your work and participation this evening. And we Thank are adjourned. Thanks for your indulgence, ma'am. Good night. Nice to see everybody.